Welcome back to another episode of ChipReport.tv. I'm Chris Gamble of the Amp Hour Podcast and Chris Gamble's Analog Life. This is our third show so far, and the chips just keep on getting better. As for me, hopefully I'm getting a little better too. I'm trying to loosen up. I've gotten your feedback, and I'm going to try and be a little more personable in the episodes. So keep on giving me feedback and let me know. This week we're going to try something a little different. Actually, all the parts that I found this week kind of fit into a theme. And not even just a theme, a project. So as we go along, we'll add each part one at a time, but try and guess what the final project might be. And at the end, I'll describe what the project could be, and then you can go off and build it. Let's get started. First up is the ISL97694 from Intersil. This is an LED string controller, and it can control up to six different strings of LEDs, with each string having 30 milliamps going through it. If you go down to four strings, you can push up to 40 milliamps going through it. It's a boost converter, so you can have a low voltage input, anywhere from 2.4 up to 5.5 volts, and on the output, you can go up to 34.5 volts. You need this because when you stack up strings of LEDs, each drop is going to have some nominal voltage, and when you have a bunch of those in a string, it can add up pretty fast. Imagine 10 LEDs at 3 volts per, per LED. That's 30 volts right there. Obviously, all this is going to depend on the, L the LED's IV characteristic, because the voltage will change as you try and pull more current through it, yada yada yada, you can figure it out. The stated application for this thing is actually backlights. So tablets, uh, phones, computer monitors, whole range of different things. But I think all your audience might be interested in other type of projects. Maybe LED home lighting, maybe some kind of costume LEDs, or maybe even creating like a waterfall effect because this thing has a lot of different dimming frequencies and modes on it that I'll talk about in a little bit here. It's a boost converter, so like I said, it has a 2.4 volt minimum input voltage, which means a lithium ion battery can power this thing pretty easily. And your efficiency is gonna change as you move through the range of different input voltages. All of this is dependent on how the chip is firing pulses through the inductor. At different duty cycles, you'll get different efficiencies. When you're not powered on, the chip itself is going to take about a milliamp of quiescent current. And when you are powered on and you're actually dimming, you can have you can use the internally generated clock. You get up to 12 bits of different resolution and settings and discrete frequencies for the dimming. And you can go up to 1.8 kilohertz on the PWM. There's different phase shifts you can do for each channel. So there's six strings of LEDs. String 1, you might not want to be dimming at the exact same frequency or starting at the exact same time as string 6. And you can actually program this in so they start at different times. The ultimate effect is you get a smoother dimming look and you won't have as much blip if you're recording it with a video camera or something similar. The switcher itself can run from 400 kilohertz up to 1.5 megahertz. So you're going to trade off power, efficiency, switching losses, but in return, you get to move the frequency around in order to avoid emissions or in order to get around a sensitive A to D that might be near it. No price is listed for yet for this part, but it's a 3x3 TQFP 16 lead part. So it's tiny, it'll fit in a lot of places, and it'll light up a lot of stuff. Next up is the DS1339A from Maxim. This is actually an update from the existing chip. The existing one doesn't have the A, and it uses more power than the, the new version. Both the old and the new are real-time clocks with serial interfaces. What's a real-time clock, you ask? Because maybe you've never heard of them before. A real-time clock is what allows your device to actually keep time. Real-time. Real <laughs> in this case, or the opposite would be if you just had an oscillator and a counter in a micro. Eventually, over time, that's going to drift. And this kind of chip is really geared towards keeping an accurate time using an uh, external crystal. This kind of chip is good in any kind of design that needs to actually keep a relative time. And you've probably thought of all these different applications before. Watches, timers, alarm clocks, all those kind of basic devices. But it extends beyond that. Think about all your embedded devices that want to know when to do a software upgrade or a firmware download. If it needs to do it 10 days later, your device needs to know when 10 days later actually is. And if it gets it by 12 days, 
you might have missed something important. In fact, you can keep track of time all the way up through 2200 AD. AD? Yeah, AD. <laughs> time and date on the output. The interface is I squared C, and it has two programmable alarms, which update every second, so you could trigger them at just about any time. The chip has auto fail detection, so if it defects, detects a fault, it'll actually switch over to a secondary power source, such as a battery. There's an output on this, which is a square wave, and that acts as a heartbeat that can go back to your micro. You'll need an external crystal, which is a standard value of 32.768 kilohertz, because that's a really easy division number. And this crystal and how much you pay for it, well, how accurate it is, that's actually going to determine your overall accuracy. The chip should not contribute any significant amount to the, the error numbers. So it really becomes a trade-off of price of the crystal versus accuracy. The chip will run you about a buck fifty, buck fifty, buck fifty, buck fifty, buck fifty in three K quantities. Buck fifty. <laughs> the usual refrain of chipreport.tv: This thing's tiny. Eight pins. Micro SOP package. So. You know what to do. Next up is the BC847. 847, BC84, that, that's a really old chip. That chip is like, that's not a chip, that's a transistor. This chip is made by everyone. What are you, what are you talking about, Chris? No, well actually, NXP has given this thing a little refresh. So you might actually have a BC847 in your parts bin at home. You probably have it right next to the 2N Quad 2s, and the 2N3904s. It's just a standard NPN part. And actually, NXP is making all those too. The fancy thing in this is actually the packaging. And you already know that chipreport.tv were never, n never cease to be amazed by how small these parts are getting. But this one's actually really starting to stretch the imagination on what you can do with packaging and how small it can get. Quick aside about the BC847, if you've never heard of it before. It's an NPN transistor, 100 milliamps can flow through this thing, and you can use up to 45 volts on it. Not on the, not on the base, but on the collector or emitter. The complement to this is actually the BC857, that's the PMP version, and those are also being released right now too. The gain is about 200, and there's three different gains that you can actually buy on this chip. There's an A, B, and C grade. It's a great general purpose BJT, small signal kind of stuff if you're doing just about any project. But the packaging, my god, it's just, <laughs> it's so tiny. <laughs> it's, it's tough because there's no scale here, right? I, I can't show you, I mean, even if I held it up, it would be like a little tiny dot on my finger. But it's small. It's also leadless, which kind of sucks. If you have any kind of hope of troubleshooting this thing, well, you're out of luck, right? If you can't get probes to touch down on the parts, you're never going to be able to tell what kind of signals are going in or coming out of this. So you will need to put test points around it. But you get a lot of space savings. The new part, the new packaging type is the DFN1006 or alternately the SOT883B or SOT. These are standard kind of part uh, packaging names, but they're just evolving them and they are getting smaller. The dimensions on this thing are one millimeter long by 0.6 millimeters wide and only 0.37 millimeters tall. Okay, let's do a little math here. <laughs> BGAs on standard chips these days are 0.8 millimeters wide. <laughs> this chip is 0.6 millimeters wide. So you go ahead and think about that in your head. The height of this thing is less than 0.4 millimeters, which I'm pretty sure is one of the smallest BGA ball sizes you can get these days. So it's tiny. It's tiny, and this is a transistor. I mean, you can get small resistors, you can get 0402s, you can get 0201s or 010.05s, however they're saying that. This thing is tiny. Let's look at power real quick. The data sheet says it can handle 250 milliwatts. But let's look more at the thermal junction because, yeah, it could handle, it can dissipate 250 milliwatts. But if you're not careful, you're going to blow this thing off the board. Let's do a little comparison. The thermal resistance on this thing is 500 Kelvin per watt. So each watt that you put into this chip, 
you're going to rise 500 degrees Kelvin or 500 degrees C if you have that offset. Now let's look at a comparable TO220 package, which is what you see a lot of BJTs and more, mostly power BJTs come in these days. It's about 2 Kelvin per watt. So this thing is 250 times worse than that. So let's just assume you're not going to be sinking any current here, okay? Because this thing, like I said, is tiny. Last up this week is the LTC 5800 from Linear Technology. Really, it's actually from Dust Networks, but Linear Technology bought them back in December of last year. It's a wireless mesh chip, and this thing is all in one. It's everything. It's got RF, it's got IO, it's got power handling, it's got internal sensors, it's got processing, you name it, it's in this chip. We'll get to the cost later. <laughs> It also complies with the IEC 62591, which is the wireless heart standard. If you're not in the industrial space, heart is used for communication and giving different uh, feedback from a sensor. So a sensor might send back a, a voltage reading, but then it'll also send back its name, its network ID, and a bunch of other stuff. This is a wireless case of that. They really point out that this chip is great in noisy environments, so you can tell that's usually a hint towards industrial. On a normal day, you'd see this thing being designed into stuff on a factory floor, such as like a pump or a sensor, but outside of that, you could really put it in anything. You could put it in your house, you could put it in a mesh network around you know, your yard. Really, on the project side, it's, it's limitless. I mean, heck, if you wanted to, you could connect your washing machine to your fridge and vice versa for whatever reason. The key is that these devices are low power, for relatively, and they do everything. In fact, they're targeting powering these things with an all-in-one, uh, these all-in-one chips with energy harvesting type chips. So, harvest the vibrational energy from your environment, solar, wind, all these different kinds of energy harvesting methods. They're, they're hoping that you can target this sensor network or the sensor network chip with one of those other chips. Oh yeah, guess who makes those other chips? It's LT. So we don't actually know how well this thing's working yet because it's not, it's not widely used, but it's tempting because it's, it's all there. Whereas before you needed to do everything and you needed to do it all discreetly, it, it's no longer that case. Even before, maybe a couple years ago, you could do it with a micro, a power management chip, and an RF front end. Now it's all one chip. Now there's an entire application layer built on top of that. So you can really tell this is, built, this is meant for software integrators, system integrators, and people who don't want to mess with anything. They want you to just pay them some money and plop this thing down and start talking to it with software. The power is relatively low in this thing. It's not super low by modern standards, but you have to imagine how much stuff it's doing, especially the RF stuff. RF can really suck down a lot of power normally. When it's receiving, it only takes 4.5 milliamps. And when it's a transmitting, it's 5.5 milliamps. To get an extra eight uh, decibels of output power, you go up to 10 milliamps. So again, you have RF processing and power management, all of that in one package for 10 milliamps. It doesn't sound like much, but again, we talked about the energy harvesting. If you imagine a solar power sensor or a controller, right? You have a controller talking to a solar panel, doing the peak power on a solar panel, uh, that thing doesn't actually output a lot of power, possibly because it's a small solar panel, because this is a this is a mesh network. It's meant to do sensor monitoring. And if you're in my hometown of Cleveland, you're only going to get about 30 days a year, so you need to really conserve your power. The package itself is a 10 by 10, 72 pin QFN. So you can get it into a lot of tight spaces. Again, if you integrate it with one of the energy harvesting chips, it shouldn't take up too much room. You also need an antenna but in this case, it's using 2.4 gigahertz radio, so you can actually design that into your board, and even when you do, it can be a small antenna. No prices are published yet, unfortunately, but if you're an early adopter, you're probably willing to pay for this thing, and especially for the space and the power savings, they're probably hoping that you know, you're willing to fork over a little more cash. So we'll have to keep you updated on when they actually release the price. One last thing about this chip, there's actually two different versions of it. There's the IPM and the WHM uh, chips that you can buy. 
The former is the, t the master controller for all the wireless nodes, and the WHM, the second one, is the general node. Because remember, in a wireless mesh network, every node is actually receiving and transmitting messages because you, it's a mesh. <laughs> you have to have lots of different devices, and that's how you actually extend your range without using more power. So, have you guessed what the potential device could be? No? Yes? Maybe. Let's put it all together anyways. So, this is just a suggestion, and I make no guarantees on this, and I have not built this myself. But, one of the fun things I think Chip Report can be about is not only telling about new chips, but also trying to group them together. As you probably remember, last time was the Summer of Sensors. So this time, I wanted to build it around a, a project idea. Because I also know how hard it can be to come up with new project ideas sometimes. There's just so many options, where do you start? So what do we have here? We have a real-time clock, an LED string, string controller or dimmer, a wireless mesh chip, and a standard NPN transistor. My idea here actually replicates a couple devices. First would be a sunrise alarm clock. Maybe you've seen these before. But using a micro, you could do readback on the real-time clock. Then you could slowly begin to increase the light output on the dimmers on the LED chip. And if you're really crafty, you could program the real-time clock to not actually need a micro. All you would need is initial programming, and then one of its two programmable alarms and some discrete logic could kick off the dimmer chip to actually start raising the LED light in a room. All of this would have the effect of simulating a sunrise. Next, using that same trigger, you would use the wireless mesh chips and talk over to your curtains. The receiver on the mesh chip would actually then output a digital I.O. signal, and that would drive an NPN transistor, and then you could drive a small servo. This would open your curtains up. Presto, you have an automated wireless mesh networked wake-up system. That's all for this week. And if you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. We really appreciate it when you do that kind of thing. And don't forget to subscribe. You can do it right up here. Until then, start dreaming about those new chips. And when you wake up, use your new wake-up machine. See you next time.